to get it against us. Again, my name's Nancy. Uh, we have two kids, Silas and Kira. Uh, they, you know, hang over me by feet now. They're very tall. Silas is 16, Kira is 14. Just a quick brag for those of you who saw Silas at like this age, he, or this size, uh, 16 and a half, he is our musician, he is our language man, he also has dreams of being in Japan one day, so love to brag on my kids, but he is, he is an awesome one. And then Kira, she runs her own bowing empire, uh, so if you need your, your yard cut, you know, maybe we can get up here uh, once, uh, we come back just for that. Um, she's also into soccer and basketball, so we love them, they're doing awesome, and um, I think yeah, just to kind of intro this morning, some of you know us, some of you don't, uh, all the new faces, but I think what you need to know about this church, what you need to maybe hear from us this morning, is that what starts here does not end here. What starts here in this church has actually gone to the ends of the earth. And I think for us, Chris and Nancy, as we stand up here, um, we are just drawn back again and again to the unconditional love that you gave us at 21 when we were here. You let us love your kids. You let us mess up. You let us bring sand onto Main Street. And you let us, you know, pull things in mud. And um, you let us, you know, go on mission trips with your kids. And, um, yeah, I think one of the things, we can talk strategy all the day long. But I think at the heart of what we want to see go to the ends of the earth is that unconditional love of the body of Christ. And you guys represented that to us immensely. And you would think that would dissipate over time, but it doesn't. And I am a little shaky, a little, a little emotional even this morning just thinking about um, all the people that loved us so well um, when we came. We're so thankful. Please hear this morning in Bible Hour, all is an extension of what you have given to us um, as a family. So thank you so much for that, and we look forward to giving more hugs here in a little bit. So I just second that, that just thank you. Um, I, there isn't hardly a week that goes by where I don't think of people from this body and what you guys taught, and uh, it's just funny, like, I mean, you guys were so gracious. I, I taught my last parenting class uh, when we were pregnant with Silas, and I, I just can't believe stuff that probably came out of my mouth to you guys. <laughs> just, oh my goodness, uh, just thank you. Um, what I learned here just continues to just move through me uh, just constantly. And uh, I just say it again, that I think folks coming out of Lynn County would make incredible missionaries. You guys have a grit and a love that is just unparalleled. And uh, we just love for you guys to just continue ordaining, sending your best and just like my home status, those of you that are a little bit older, thank God there's four quarters, right? <laughs> We've got, I'm going, I'm on my way home today to Texas, I'm going to be talking to a 77-year-old lady. Uh, she dedicated her life to Jesus and then married the wrong guy. Is her, this is her testimony. And, and was married for, I don't know, probably about 50 years. He just passed away, and she came to us two years ago and said, could you train me to go to the nations? And so she and a 66-year-old lady just trained with us last year. The 66-year-old lady now lives with some refugees uh, in Houston, reaching Afghans. And this 77-year-old lady is looking to move to the UK uh, amongst Muslim women there. And uh, she's like, hey, all my relatives live pretty healthily to about 95. I feel like I got at least 10, 15 years in me. And uh, so I just dropped that one on you, just like, let's go, you know. Um, and there's no excuses uh, in that. So can I just pray with you and pray over you? Um, can I have some fun things to share that I think the world is teaching us about Jesus this morning? And uh, just excited. And so I'd like to just start letting you pray. Would you just ask God to help you fall more in love with Jesus this morning? Would you just in your hearts pray that, and then I'd love to pray over you. All right. God, I just thank you for this body and how uh, you just continue to do great works of God, that lives change because of the gospel here. Father, there is an unconditional love that we come to this place and our shame gets removed, our guilt can turn to innocence in you, and we can love each other not because of how awesome we are, but because of the gospel. God, Father, I just thank you that these 
this body lives that out. They live that out to me. They live that out to this county, to the nations. Thank you for the impact of this church upon the nations. And, uh, Father, as we speak today, we speak with we, not I, uh, because we are in this together. And, Lord, I just pray there would be power uh, through the gospel in this body. That is, kids are shared with on the soccer fields as teachers go from this place, coaches go from this place, workers from this place, that their co-workers would be impacted because of the way uh, this body lives when it's scattered throughout the week. And Father, I pray that uh, there would just be a continued just multiplication of disciples uh, through this body. May the world be changed as leaders continue to move from this place and operate in this place. Just thank you for all the ways that this body has loved and continues to do so. Uh, would you uh, just fill them with resources, with <coughs> courage, with a faith that makes uh, many things that they are attempting now feel small 10 years from now. In Jesus' name, amen. So just want to start by uh, just sharing uh, just real quick kind of what in the world are the Merrills doing in Texas. Uh, at one point in time, we were on our way to India. We thought we were moving to India. And we were going to move to this place called College Station, Texas for a year and then move to India. And God had different plans for us. And we'd just love to share with you some of what God's up to. And so Caleb's back on the slides. If we want to just, just hit these slides like every two seconds, I'm just going to talk while you flip through them. Um, so what we do is uh, we gather folks, um, a lot of students, a lot of families, a lot of empty nesters into groups like those. And uh, then just start taking them out and just showing them how to share the gospel. Folks that are wanting to move to the nations long term. And uh, we, what we say is we play with real dynamite in the sense that um, uh, we want to take them out as we're training them to be missionaries and reach Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Chinese right in our midst. And so we start seeing them bring friends like these to Jesus. And uh, they're learning how to multiply the gospel right there in our context through the international students and immigrants that live right there in Texas. And they start baptizing some of these new believers and learning how to form groups. And we're living like missionaries every year with new groups of people right there at Texas A&M, preparing them to go long term. And then uh, as, as they begin to go out, um, we keep, keep rolling a little bit. As they keep going out, um, uh, it's not just a few of them. We gather with other people around the nation that we help lead, and then we pray them out on the teams like this one. This is one of our teams that's in the Middle East. This next slide. Um, and uh, so these guys are serving in the Middle East there, and you can just keep rolling, bro, every two or three seconds. And uh, so some of, the, some of the students that go out, and then they start living there, what they lived in College Station, just as they learn languages and uh, move. They're planting churches in some very unique places, and it's just been a blast uh, to see. Um, and uh, so this young man in amongst the uh, Arabic people group in Chad, a nomadic people group, and uh, this is you stop there. This is just a, a map of some of the places we've recently sent. And uh, a lot of those are teams going out into these different places. And I'll just tell you this is where you think the gospel is not moving because of your news sources. The gospel is moving incredibly. And it's just so fun to see um, uh, one that I won't be specific, but the country there that starts with A. Uh, there's a young lady there that is amongst a people group with no, no believers. And she's had uh, more than 70 women now start studying the Bible uh, with her. She has a fitness business that she teaches Muslim women how to just take care of their bodies, take care of their souls, take care of their emotional health, and uh, just beginning to plant the church. And so we really want to impact uh, kind of that stripe across North Africa and the Middle East, all the way to China, where the gospel is rare. In a lot of these places, you have more of a chance of getting struck by lightning than you do of hearing the gospel. And uh, that's where we want to send these young people. And if you have kind of this attitude in your mind that the millennial generation and Generation Z, kind of that younger generation, can't commit, I would just say you just need to flush that out. As we've asked young people to, to consider tithing their life to the nations, would you, at a minimum, give seven years of your life to the places where the gospel is not known? Uh, that's what they're stepping forward to do. And uh, many of them are going with a very long-term mindset to go into these places, plant businesses, or uh, be coaches, and, and just different entry strategies to get into places like Saudi Arabia or, or like North Africa. And uh, it's just been incredible to see the gospel is moving, just as you're going to hear all this month. God is not uh, at all intimidated by what's happening in this world. He is moving like never before. We are alive in one of the most 
incredible times in the kingdom of God as he continues to, to scatter the gospel throughout. So if you want to hear more about our ministry, we'll share a little bit more uh, in the Bible Hour. Um, let me catch up with Caleb here. And uh, what I'd love to talk through today is, uh, if we can hit the next slide, Caleb, uh, is just some things that I've been learning from uh, some of the believers around the world. Uh, isn't it awesome that we are kind of now the minority of believers? And if you think the average Christian is an American, uh, you're you're wrong. About 90% of the kingdom of God now lives in Africa, South America, and Asia. 90% of those that are following Jesus now live in South America, Africa, and Asia. And, and what's interesting is just when, as they look at the gospel, they just help me fall more in love with Jesus than I think I ever have. And so, um, so I just want to talk through this gospel and uh, just help you fall more in love with Jesus. This is one of my really good friends. Um, I haven't seen him in, in, in a few years, but this is Brother Ying. And uh, he has seen literally hundreds of thousands of churches planted through his ministry. And one day he comes walking into my office and uh, he says, uh, Chris, and he spoke in an Asian accent that I'm not going to try to imitate, uh, but it sounds so wise when he said it. He said, Chris, I'm so tired of $10 salvation. And he just paused, and he would do this often, and he would wait for me to say, what do you mean? And uh, he said, well, Chris, if, if I came in and I gave you a card with $10 in it, you'd be like, oh, thanks. And you'd stop at Whataburger, this uh, restaurant we have in Texas, and get a burger on your way home, and it would be great. But, it, but if I came in and gave you a million dollars, and I convinced you that it was real, and I not only convinced you that you had a million dollars, but... If you got on the phone and called your mom and bought her a new house or a new car and, and you just started gifting people that every time you gifted someone, they got a million dollars and you continued to, your bank account just kept bouncing back up to a million. If that's what your salvation was, then what would you attempt? I would love to see more million dollar salvation. So uh, I just want you to fall in love with Jesus with me as we look at the gospel from the lens of some different places. And so uh, we're going to kind of cube uh, this. I'm going to give you $100 salvation to start. But I want to cube that and get to a million dollars. And uh, we can go to the next slide. And uh, uh, I just want to kind of start with some parables of Jesus. Jesus told two just really quick parables. In this one, he says, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And that's just so challenging to me that the kingdom of God would be worth more than anything else I had. And Jesus knew we wouldn't get it on the first round. And so in the very next verse, he tells this parable. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and body. So what Jesus is saying is that the kingdom of God should dominate our life in such a way that in all of our joy, it should be worth everything that we have. One thing that amazes me is as we mobilize folks to the nations, quite often people will give as excuses the blessings of, that God has given them as excuses not to go to the nations or not to be all in and sending others to the nations. When God has actually blessed us that we might be a blessing to all peoples, and everything that we have should come under the, the value of, of the gospel that is within us. We are eternal beings, and Jesus has given us the gospel in such a way that it is, it is worth even more. And so Jesus talked about this a couple other times. At one point, he was, he was at, a, at a dinner with some Pharisees, and this woman, if you remember the story, she comes in, and she's a less than honorable woman, but she goes to Jesus and begins to wash, wash his feet. And, and uh, the Pharisees that he's eating with kind of react to this. And Jesus tells this story. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? So if Jesus asked you that and you thought about it, you'd have been like, well, probably the 500 denarii guy. I mean, that, he would probably love more. And, and so they answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. And so what I've found is that the debt of what Jesus has forgiven me, the guy that I held Bible bearer's hand when I was four years old and trusted Jesus, I wasn't like, I don't have the crack addict uh, testimony or anything like that. But the debt of what Jesus has given has just continued to increase 
of just not by rubbing my face in all of my sin, but by looking at how glorious of a salvation that he has given me. And so I just want to walk through just what this might look like. And so let's hit the next slide. Uh, anthropologists, people that study the culture of, of different uh, cultures around the world, kind of break cultures up into three parts. And so there's the guilt-innocence kind of frame of mind, and that's where most of us live. And that, that frame of mind, we kind of understand the gospel as if we were guilty of sin, and Jesus made us innocent. And so it's almost a courtroom thing. Some of you have maybe even heard uh, kind of the illustration that the judge gets up from behind his, his, his area and comes over and pays your debt because you're guilty of sin. How many of you have heard that illustration before? And, kind of, and our salvation, quite often, it's I'm guilty of sin, but Jesus makes me innocent. And, uh, but other people live in more of a shame-honor culture. And this is the culture that Jesus grew up in. And this is like... Being guilty of sin and forgiven of sin isn't quite enough because in a shame on our culture, which we're actually moving more and more closer to in America, in a shame on our culture, it matters kind of what's your status in society. And so it might be something you did or it might be something done to you that tarnishes your last name and tarnishes your standing in your village or in your city or even in your nation. And you might be less than and perceive yourself to be a lot less than because of your reputation. Now, I know nothing like that ever happens in Mount City, Kansas, right? Like, we never look at people through the lens of what they've done in their past or what, where, you know, we're very much have this built into us. And we can kind of relate to this shame and honor. And in that culture, the gospel is a whole lot more about removing that shame and inserting honor. That the king of the universe, the creator of all things, the most powerful being in all the world would have me as a son or a daughter, and my honor is restored. And what was done to me, or what I have done in the past, no longer matters because I now have status. I am the son or daughter of the king. And that kind of feels odd to us to think about that, but that's what Jesus did for us as well. And then there's fear power culture. This is about, about a billion people um, live in fear power culture. These are folks that we'll talk about in a minute that they're just they're scared of the spirits. They're scared of awesome. It's the power from the Holmes jersey. Just kind of took the mic out. <laughs> he, he lives uh, not too far. One of the guys that we uh, that was on the pictures actually. Um, when they show on Sports Center every now and then they'll show Mahomes dunking over somebody and one of the goers that we trained his name is Chris uh, he gets dunked on by Mahomes and he's like all over at Sports Center whenever Mahomes does something awesome and uh, it's just like there's Chris there's Chris and it's just something to be famous for lots of shame he needs honor but uh, in, fear and power, in the fear power uh, gospel uh, that's where like tribal people being afraid of the spirits and then Jesus rescues them from that and allows them to have a, a fearless or, or not be afraid any longer. And that's the gospel. Another way to look at these cultures is that in a guilt-innocence culture, if you're swimming at the pool, in a public pool, and a, and a lifeguard blows the whistle, what do you do? You usually stop and turn and turn to the lifeguard and see who is in trouble or if you're in trouble, right? And that's kind of a, a guilt-innocence mindset that we have. We're like, who's the troublemaker? And we're individualistic in that. But, but uh, those that live in shame-honor cultures, if the lifeguard blows the whistle, I've seen it in Kazakhstan many times, they'll just keep on swimming because they're like, they're not going to show dishonor by being, taking a chance that they're the ones that the lifeguard's getting on. And uh, the lifeguard just has to blow like three or four times or quietly correct somebody. And then in the fear-power culture, if the lifeguard blows his whistle, everybody's just going to go underwater. Kind of like your three-year-old that's like, I don't hear you saying five more minutes, Mom. I'm underwater. You know? And uh, they're just going to go underwater in fear of anything of authority. And so we can roll, bro, um, to the next slide. And so uh, what this looks like uh, this morning is I would love to just kind of introduce the gospel in a way that uh, looks like this. This is, you can go back to the video. Yeah, let it roll. These are people that are putting on special glasses. They're colorblind, but they're putting on glasses to see color for the very first time. And I think sometimes when we view the gospel just through one lens, 
we're missing out on this full color gospel that God has given us, that Jesus has given us. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, anybody colorblind in here? Nobody's going to raise their hand. I've just thought, what would it be like to let my dad put some glasses like that on? He's colorblind and just see the world. My mom has bright red hair and I wonder if he's ever seen it. And just understand uh, just the world. And so I hope it can be uh, just kind of an image like that for you. And so just to kind of walk through a couple of verses, just so you can kind of see this in Scripture. This is all over Scripture. Is the guilt and innocence gospel is kind of, kind of expressed in this, in this verse. It's for the wages of sin... Our, our, is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're guilty of sin, but Jesus paid the price for that sin. That's the gospel, right? And then shame, honor looks more like this. Whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame, but honor is for you who believe. For a, ch a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. When I hear my Chinese and Japanese brothers and sisters my Asian brothers and sisters express the gospel. This is one of the primary verses that they use to express the gospel. That I felt shame. I, I know I've been forgiven for what I've done, but still who I was was shameful. But now I'm part of a, royal, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. That's us. We're part of that. We have no shame to wear any longer. We have honor through Jesus Christ. And then the fear of power. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. If you can imagine living in fear of the spirits that are all around you, and then suddenly meeting this Jesus that is the God above all gods. That's our gospel. All of this is the, the frameworks of our gospel, the full-color gospel of who Jesus is. And so if we can hit the next, uh, next slide, um, let's actually go to... This is kind of the gospel as most of us have understood it. Go to the next one there, put some words on there. There we go. God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. People are sinful and guilty before God. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice and just payment for your sins. You must receive Jesus as your personal Savior and he will make you innocent before God. Most of us, when it came time to understand the gospel, this was, this was something that we had communicated to us that clicked into our culture and we understood what Jesus had done. That, oh my goodness, there's a, there's a God that would forgive me of my guilt. I don't have to live in guilt, and I can be forgiven, and I can live in eternity with him, and I can begin this life that he has for me now. That's, that's the gospel that drew me to this church. When I came and interviewed at this church, what the reason I chose to come to Mount City was because man after man, woman after woman that I met, they had stories of, this is who I was, and this is who I now am in Christ. Roy Purvis is one of the greatest examples. Just a, a man that met Jesus and it just radically changed his life. And that was when I knew, when I heard his testimony in, in well, I guess that building, I just knew this was the place I was going to come and serve at, at 21. And just That's the gospel. But I want you to unpack this even further and just begin to experience the gospel through shame and honor. And so in a shame and honor culture, the word shame means to in, in many languages, in, in Korean and in, in Thai, for sure, it means to rip somebody's face off. Like it's a, if, if you actually take the word apart, it means you're ripping their face off. And if you think about it, in a, in a society where everybody's kind of worried about their pecking order and kind of where they stand in society and, and how do I fit in and can I be seen in these circles, am I welcome in these circles, what I've done or what my family has done, it doesn't, might not even be what I've done, it, just might, it might even be what my grandfather has done, dishonors me and it rips my face off. People don't see me, they see what I've done and what's been done to me or what my family is known for. And I am so full of shame. And think how defeating that is to live in. Some of you in this room might even feel that shame because in a town this large, we know everybody. I kind of felt that shame when I moved here with Nancy and she looked 13 and I would walk down Main Street <laughs> holding her hand. One time, one time, my first time meeting Kenny Otto, he's working a track meet with Nancy and he comes in and he's asking the guys at the table, who's the ju new junior hire helping with the discus? And it was Nancy. And so that's a funny version of shame. But you might not have a funny version of shame. 
You might have some things you've done in your past or that family members have done in your past, and you know that when people in your small town or, or your er rural area look at you, you feel that. And it sits. Or even worse, when you look at others, you might rip their face off and you might just see that. But what's beautiful is this is our gospel. This is even more of what God did when he sent Jesus to the cross and he rose again. This is our gospel. This is the same gospel, just kind of through a different lens. This is like the, some more color tones of the same gospel. And this is, this is a gospel that, that clicks with my Asian friends. God values you. Oh, let's go back to that. Yeah. Boom. There we go. God values you and wants to honor you as his child. People are shameful and dishonor God, but Jesus bore all your shame and restores your honor. You must give allegiance to Jesus to enter God's family. If you feel shame, like you're like, I know my sin is forgiven and I'm innocent, but I still feel shame. I just want to speak over you. You are God's honored child, and there is no shame in you. To be born anymore. You need to walk around with your head held high and be like, son of the king. Son of the king. That's who I am. That's what Jesus did for me. I am daughter of, I'm not, but I'm speaking as if I'm you. I'm daughter of the king. Like, do you see how that just rescues people from that shame? And when we view others, can we just, especially in, in a town where we just know everybody's name, can we just view them through a lens of honor because not only does the gospel change how we view ourselves, but it should change how we view others. And we should think like, oh man, I, I wonder what God could do with him. I wonder what God could do with her. One of the most beautiful rewards that this church has given me is at the end of my time as being a youth pastor, if I would have wrote down that the, some of the students that I didn't think I made an impact in their lives, I, I'd have had a pretty long list. Like, man, I gotta just never pay attention. That girl, wow, I just could never quite get her to see and hear. And over the years, different, different students have called at different parts in their life and just talked about how that, that they heard, they listened, they saw, and their lives are radically changed. Many of which who don't live here in Mount City any longer or in Lynn County any longer, but they're walking with Jesus and just doing beautiful things. And, and it's just so fun to talk to them about how they're an honored child of God. And they don't bear that shame any longer of whatever it was in the past that they're, that they're filled with. And so I just want you to just rejoice in Jesus that this is what he did for us. My salvation isn't just a ticket to heaven, but it's I'm an honored child of the king. And he knows everything about me. That should blow our minds. This next one is something that um, is a little bit, little bit harder to understand sometimes. And this is the fear power mindset. And cultures that are fear power, these are tribal cultures quite often. Or sometimes many of my Hindu friends, they live in fear of the spirits, the fear of the gods. Hinduism is a, is a, a society more than it is a religion. And it's a society that has rules of how do I keep the gods straight and kind of at arm's distance from me. Because God is nothing like somebody that I want to know and be close to, much less have inside of me. That would scare me to go in if, I, if I'm in a fear power culture. And so rather than just sharing about fear power, I want you to just experience, this is a, a tribe, a reenactment of a tribe that came to Christ through uh, one of my friends and just wants you to watch what fear, experiencing Jesus through fear power looks like. Sorry, that's the journey of somebody that's scared of the spirits when Jesus enters them and they just become free. And I would just challenge you, could you come up with a story that little kids can understand that can confound old men and women and is true for everybody in every place at all times in all languages? That's the gospel. And that's why I love Jesus. And as I see the gospel move throughout the world, I just fall more and more in love with him and just realize how much more powerful he is. And so the gospel and a fear of power is just that God is all-powerful and offers you spiritual authority. I don't know that we live in this reality very often as Americans because we don't need his power as often sometimes. But people fearfully live under the authority of evil. And Jesus had power over nature, disease, spirits, and triumphed over death. That's the gospel to these guys. 
And you must know Jesus to access his divine power to live in freedom. That's our power. I don't know if anybody in here lives with fear, but Jesus has just trampled that fear. There's nothing that he didn't demonstrate he can defeat. And he rescues you from fear and, and gives you power in the gospel. And so I'd like to just take you through one last thing to close, okay? And that is this. And this is one of my favorite places to go with people from all kinds of different cultures. It's a metaphor that often they understand even more than me. A metaphor of a shepherd. And it's a metaphor that just speaks of God's heart for us. And in Psalm 23, you're probably familiar with it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I just challenge you this week in your quiet time, tonight in your home groups, if you, or small groups, whatever, I don't know what they call it now, uh, whatever you call them, are, you're going to look at this passage again and just look at the richness of what God's done for you. And I just ask you to pray through it this week. But I'd also like you to just, this morning, if you would just grab something to write with or a phone or something like that, I would like you to do something I sometimes do in my quiet time. And, and just to, to make sure I'm understanding is sometimes I'll write the anti or the opposite of what the Bible is saying. And I would love for you to just begin that process. we got just a minute or two. I'd love for you to just begin the process of what would it be like to live in total lostness? If this gospel we've been talking about had never come to you, your family, your people, your city, your village, to live in absolute total lostness, for this not to be true about you or anybody you knew, what would that be like for you? Because when we walk with Jesus, it's so glorious that we forget what it's like to be lost. And so I would love to give you a minute, whether you do this mentally or on paper, I'd love for you to just write the anti-Psalm 23. What would your anti-Psalm 23 be? The exact opposite. And just start. What, what, just take that first sentence. What would the exact opposite be? Put it in your own words. What would it what, be like to live completely separated from the gospel? So this is my anti-Psalm 23. It's already on the screen. I didn't realize that. And I'll, I'll just read it to you. You can work on yours in your quiet time. But this is, to me, it reminds me of what lostness is. A guy that met Jesus at four doesn't remember lostness, but I need to remember it so that I understand what people are going through without the gospel. People groups are going through without the gospel. And it says this, I am a sheep on my own, hungry, cold, thirsty, the very definition of torment. I walk to exhaustion in the desert where there is no good water. My soul, my emotional health and mental health are deteriorating. I don't know what to do, where to go. There has to be something more. I am in the dark valley and the shadow of death is upon me. Evil predators are inches from me. I'm alone, vulnerable, without protection. My anxiety over my enemies keeps me from eating. I am a disgrace of a sheep. My cup is empty and cracked. Surely destruction and curses will follow me all the days of my life. It's only a matter of time before I am devoured. The reason this is worth it, the reason it's worth it to, to give and to send and to go is because people live in that reality. Millions of people, entire people groups still live in that reality where no one around them knows the gospel. And this is the reality of the life that they walk and the reality of the beautiful gospel that we can bring to them by God's power. And so this week, we'd love here in a quiet time just to finish, to finish that up. Just look at Psalm 23 and write your anti-Psalm 23. Just write it out and just put it in your Bible. You don't have to make yours sound like mine. You can write it however you want. But I just encourage you, at the end of, of this, right in the middle of Missions Week, we can go to the next slide there and the verses on it. At the end of Missions Week, I'd just like to close with this slide, is that sometimes Missions Month can be awesome. You hear about all these things God is doing, but it can also kind of feel like there's a varsity team and a JV team. There's the Patrick Mahomes. 
that are going out and doing all this awesome stuff in Kenya and Latin America and just places that all these flags represent. And then I'm here in Lynn County and I must be JV. And I just, there's no JV in the kingdom of God. I would just end with this, is, is who is more like God, the one that goes or the one that sins? And read that verse behind me. That just as the Father sent me, so even so, even so I am sending you. That God the Father could have come himself, but he sent Jesus so that he could demonstrate what it meant to be a sacrificial goer, I mean, sacrificial sender, as Jesus was the goer. And so church, please send your best to the nations, and please be the best senders. Because both reflect the nature of God to the lost world. And as we go, may we not go in guilt or in shame or in fear, but may we go in love with Jesus, who has given us innocence, who's given us honor, who's given us power. So let's just revel in that this week, that this God that's moving all throughout the nations is the God that lives in us. And these gifts of the gospel are ours. Are we looking at them? Are we valuing them? Is it the treasure in the field that we give with joy, sell everything else for? Because it's so valuable to us. So let me pray. Father, just thank you for sending your son, for demonstrating what it looks like to sacrificially sin. Father, I just continue to beg of this church that there are more stories of, of those that are sent from this body and more stories of those that uh, you bless greatly that can be sinners, that can just increase the, uh, the work uh, that happens right here in the county. And so, Father, would you fill us to the brim and beyond with this amazing gospel. Help us to fall more in love with you that we might be willing to do even more in our joy. So I uh, thank you for Joe. I thank you for his faithfulness, God. I just pray that you would sustain he and Terry. And uh, Father, I just thank you for uh, just the mark of this man and just how he has led here. And uh, Father, I pray that you would strengthen him. In Jesus' name, amen.